Okay. So I would uh, first would like to uh, to thank the organizing committee for inviting me for this lecture, especially Professor Hassan Kamil Soukou. So uh, today I will talk to you about uh, cementoplasty, so a percutaneous treatment that we are using a lot uh, in my department. So these are my uh, disclosure and uh, a short introduction about what is cementoplasty. So the principle is very simple. It's uh, to inject via a percutaneous route an acrylic uh, bone cement, the uh, polymethyl metacrylate, uh, PMMA, and uh, so it's not like a, a cement that you use to build a, a wall, but it's an acrylic resin, which you can find in the uh, constitution on, of uh, some furniture uh, with plexiglass. So uh, this, uh, this uh, cement has two components, a liquid component and a powder component. And when you mix the liquid component and the powder component, uh, you will, uh, it will be a, a, a mixture which will polymerize in a couple of minutes and from a liquid uh, um, a polymer, you will have a solid polymer which will reinforce the bone that you want to treat with this PMMA uh, bone cement. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, um, it's a, what, if we speak about the history of the, uh, the, the, the cementoplasty and the vertebroplasty, so it's a kind of patriotic uh, slide. It has been developed by a French uh, physician in the mid 80s, in 1987, by Professor Galibert, who was a neurosurgeon, and Professor De Ramon who was an international neuroradiologist. They were working in Amiens, in the north of France. So it's a collaboration between neurosurgeon and a radiologist. And it has been developed the first time for the treatment of an aggressive vertebral hemangioma. And afterwards, the, uh, the, the indication of this technique expanded. We will see afterwards for the treatment of bone metastasis or for osteoporosis. So just a few words about the technical aspect. So as for each uh, intervention, you have to uh, to uh, to have the pre-operative radio radiological workup, including a CT scan to uh, analyze the cortical uh, bone uh, to see if there is a disruption of the posterior wall, and MRI to uh, see if there is uh, um, uh, an, an extension of the lesion uh, to the soft tissue or to the epidural space. The interest of this technique is that it could be used with a short or, uh, hospital stay, less than 24 hours. The, the treatments are usually performed under conscious sedation, but sometimes we can do it under general anesthesia, especially for a uh, young patient because the bone is very, very hard. And we will inject the cement. We will see an example. The cement will be injected uh, either under X-ray, depend on the on the uh, on the habits of each uh, team, either under X-ray guidance or under CT guidance. And after the procedure, we perform systematically a CT scan to evaluate the distribution of the PMMA bone cement inside the lesion and to depict a, a possible a leak of the cement around the vertebra. And we, the patient, after the treatment, can stand up six hours after the treatment because the, 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 the hardness of the cement is, 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 uh, is the maximum after 15 minutes after the preparation of the, of the cement. So here you have some photographs showing you the, the different step of the uh, on, of the vertebroplasty. So it's uh, it's performed in in prone position with uh, in uh, in uh, with a strict surgical asepsy, and afterwards we will uh, do a local anesthesia uh, in addition to the conscious sedation, and we will uh, uh, put the bone needle under fluoroscopic guidance uh, inside the vertebral body. And when the, 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 the bone needles are uh, inserted inside the vertebral body in the good positioning, we will prepare the cement. So as I told you, there is a powder component and a liquid component of the cement that we will mix for one minute. And afterward, we will connect the, uh, the syringe with the bone cement with this connector, which are called the extents, to, to be far from the, uh, uh, the X-ray uh, beam. And we will connect this, uh, this, uh, uh, this syringe to the bone needle in order to inject the bone cement. We always inject the bone cement in lateral projection. Why? It's to depict the posterior wall of the vertebra in order to be sure that we won't have any leakage inside the spinal uh, canal. 
because this is the bone needle we use. It's a beveled uh, ball needle in order to better control the positioning of the, the bone needle. The diameter of the bone needle usually we use are uh, uh, 11 gauge. So in most cases, we use a B pedicular, uh, B uh, transpedicular approach. So this is the most easy, easiest, this is the easiest way to uh, position the, uh, the bone needle inside uh, the vertebral body because it's very simple. The, the landmark, the bone landmark are very simple to see on X-ray. So uh, it depends, this, uh, this number depends on the vertebral you will treat because the, the size of the vertebra is not the same for an upper uh, thoracic level and lower lumbar level. But usually it's uh, six centimeters from the midline and the angulation is about 10 to 15 degrees. So this is the transpedicular approach. And when you use a transpedicular approach, you, we, we, we put two bone needles, one through each pedicle. So you see here the, the, the X-ray uh, um, uh, guidance for the transpedicular approach. So we enter in the pedicle uh, in AP projection, strict AP pro uh, projection, and we enter in the superior external quadrant of the, uh, the pedicle. And we want not to, uh, to, uh, to enter in the spinal canal. So we, you don't have to cross this, uh, this uh, inner cortical uh, bone. Uh, before entering the uh, vertebral body. So what are the contraindications to this transpedicular approach? When you have some surgical material, when you have a posterior fixation, you cannot access through the, uh, the, the surgical ma material. When the pedicle uh, has a lytic lesion or when it's fractured because the bone cement will uh, be pushed back around the, the bone needle and will enter inside the spinal canal. And also when the pedicle is too small, when it's smaller compared to the size of the bone needle, you won't be able to use this transpedicular approach. So this is an example of a mistake. The operator used a transpedicular approach, but you know, you see that the, 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 the pedicle was, uh, uh, was lytic, there was a fracture, and when he injected the cement, you have a, a backflow of the cement along the, the, the uh, the bone needle, which enter inside the spinal canal. So when you have a lytic uh, uh, pedicle, you, are, you, don't, you cannot use the transpedicular approach. What is the alternative to the transpedicular approach? It's the posterolateral approach. So you won't enter the pedicle, but you will go along laterally to the pedicle towards the center of the vertebral body. So usually when we use this approach, we only use one needle because you can reach the center of the vertebra using only one needle. And once more, this number depends on the vertebra you will treat, but usually you are 10 centimeters from the midline and the, the angle is about 30 to 40 uh, degrees. So here, an example of a patient uh, who presented with a vertebral hemangioma, an aggressive vertebral hemangioma. So the patient was, uh, uh, was symptomatic with a compression. So the, he, he underwent first a surgical decompression with this uh, posterior fixation. So here, you cannot use the transpedicular approach because you have some material in front of the pedicle. So what we use in this case, we use the posterolateral approach and we will go along the material inside the center aspect of the vertebral body. So we use only one needle. And afterwards, through this uh, needle, we can inject the cement in order to fill completely the vertebral hemangioma. What about the cement we inject? There are different kinds of cement that you can find on the market. You have low viscosity cement or high viscosity cement. In, in the daily practice, we use a low viscosity cement. And the time window to inject, so between uh, the moment uh, in which the cement is too liquid and the moment the, the, the cement is too solid is about five minutes. And this time window, the time in, during which you can inject the cement uh, will depend on the cement itself, low viscosity or high viscosity bone cement, but also the temperature of the, uh, the room where you are, you are doing the procedure. So if you have a low temperature, you have a longer time window, so you can inject for a longer time the bone cement, but you will increase the risk of cement uh, leakage. 
So what about the specific case of cervical vertebroplasty? So the, the, the route to access the vertebral body is not the same compared to uh, uh, thoracic uh, vertebra or lumbar vertebra. So we use the, uh, uh, the uh, right anterolateral approach. So why the right side? Because the uh, other fagus is located on the left side, it's paramedian uh, compared to the, uh, the, the, the cervical spine on the left side. So we want to avoid to have a transfixion of the esophagus. That's why we go from the right side. So you put your fingers uh, as a hook in order to push laterally the, uh, the, the, carot the, the, the carotid artery to avoid uh, the, to have a transfixion of the carotid artery. So you, we will put the needle from this right anterolateral approach between your uh, your fingers, which are uh, as a hook uh, to 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 push laterally the carotid artery between the trachea and the carotid artery. So you will go in between these two uh, these two axes in order to reach the center as the central aspect of the vertebral body. So this is the positioning uh, we want to reach with the bone needle inside at the middle aspect of the vertebral body. Usually, we do this uh, cervical vertebroplasty in uh, biplane fluoroscopic guidance. It's to better depict the posterior leak inside the spinal canal and the lateral leak uh, toward the uh, uh, close to the vertebral artery to be sure that we won't have any leak in the vertebral basilar system. So we, the patient usually is under general anesthesia because it's very uh, uncomfortable if you do it under conscious sedation. And we will uh, put the bone needle between the cervical uh, ICA, uh, internal carotid artery, and the trachea, which is uh, medially. And you see, e the, you see here the fluor fluoroscopic guidance in AP and lateral projection at the same time to be sure that we will reach the center aspect of the, uh, the vertebral body. Then we will prepare the bone cement, and afterward we will inject on both AP anterior, uh, anterior posterior projection and lateral projection at the same time under fluoroscopic guidance. We will inject the bone cement, which is in this syringe, connected to the bone needle, and we will follow the uh, filling of the vertebral body, of the cervical vertebral, vertebral body in anterior posterior projection and in lateral projection. And afterward, we compress for two minutes to be sure that we won't have any hematoma because sometimes you can have a transfixion of some small branches of the external carotid artery. So sometimes one of the complications could be an hematoma at the cervical, uh, in the cervical area. So an example here, you have this osteolytic lesion of the C4 vertebra with a posterior wall disruption. So here you have the positioning in uh, anterior posterior projection of the bone needle. It's an 11 gauge bone needle from the right side, right anterolateral approach towards the center aspect of the vertebral body. And afterwards, we inject in AP and lateral projection fluoroscopic guidance, the bone cement, which will help to, uh, to fill the bone lesion. You can see the filling of this osteolytic lesion. You have a little bit of leakage. This is very frequent at the entry point of the, uh, of the bone needle, but usually it has no clinical uh, consequence. So here are a few words about a case series we published in 2020. Uh, it was our experience uh, using uh, vertebral plastic for uh, cervical lesion. So we included about 130 patients. 176 uh, vertebrae were treated by vertebral plastic. This is the distribution of the lesion we treated. So we included, we also treated a, a lesion of the C1 uh, vertebra. Uh, most of the patient, most of the lesion treated were uh, metastasis, and we had only 2.2% uh, uh, of major complication. At uh, our early experience, we had a fatal uh, cement embolism in the vertebral basilar system. Uh, it was at the at this time we were treated uh, the patient under only monoplan uh, guidance, and since this time we always use uh, anteroposterior and lateral guidance at the same time because if you use only one plane, uh, you cannot sometimes see a lateral uh, leakage 
towards the vertebral artery. We had also a vertebral spasm, which led to an acute ischemic stroke uh, in the vertebral basilar system. And we had one case of compressive cervical hematoma, which required a prolonged uh, uh, oral intubation. We had two minor complications, which were uh, two non-compressive cervical hematoma. And you see the cement leakage are not so rare about, uh, uh, in about half of the cases. So the cement leakage are often along the entry point of the bone needle. And as I told you, usually you have no clinical consequence. You can sometimes have some swallowing disturbances for a couple of days, but usually it's resolved spontaneously. The volume of cement we use for cervical uh, uh, lesion is very low because the volume of the vertebral body uh, of the cervical spine is low. And in our theories, we have uh, the average filling of the lesion was 71%. And in terms of clinical um, uh, result, in terms of, uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, pain evolution, so in more than 80% of the cases, patient had a good uh, clinical outcome in, ter in terms of uh, pain relief. And only three among these uh, 136 patients required a surgical fixation after the vertebroplasty. And we didn't, uh, the patient didn't experience fracture that uh, uh, needed to be treated at the uh, level treated by cervical vertebroplasty. Another focus on uh, for me, the most difficult uh, uh, vertebra to, to treat, which are the upper thoracic level vertebrae, uh, which are T1 and T2. Why are they difficult to treat? Because usually you have an increased uh, thoracic kyphosis and you have a superimposition of the shoulder and the scapula, which makes uh, the, the delimitation of the landmark of the vertebral body very difficult. And also the, the shape of the first vertebral body of the upper uh, thoracic spine has a triangular shape. And it's sometimes very difficult to know if you are still inside the vertebra or if you, uh, you, go, you went uh, 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 further after the anterior wall. So for, in, uh, for instance, in this case, you can see that you are still inside the vertebral body in lateral projection, but you are outside the vertebral body. And sometimes you have this, could have this kind of leak because the tip of your bone needle was outside the vertebral body due to this, uh, this uh, triangular uh, shape. And also you can see on this lateral projection that you don't really see the T1 vertebra. Uh, so it's one uh, of the difficulty when you are doing this uh, vertebroplasty because you have some superimposition with the, the shoulder. So we have, a can, uh, we have a, a, some tips and tricks to try to uh, overcome this limitation. So first the positioning of the arms of the patient. So you can use the swimmer uh, positioning like uh, uh, display in this photograph. You can also put the arm of the patient along uh, this body and uh, uh, perform a caudal traction of the arm. So it will help to, to better see uh, the T1 and T2 uh, uh, vertebrae. Uh, you can also tilt uh, in craniocaudal uh, fashion the lateral uh, tube. What we use often is we add uh, with the, uh, the powder component and the liquid component, we add some tungsten powder to increase the radio opacity of the, the bone cement. And also we use the uh, 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 Scopy Mod Plus. So here you have an example of regular fluoroscopy. You don't really see why it's T1. When you use the Scopy Plus uh, 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 program, you better see the landmark of the T1 and especially the posterior wall of the vertebra. And it will help you when you inject the bone cement to uh, depict uh, um, a possible uh, leakage. So what are the indications of the percutaneous vertebroplasty? As I told you, it has been developed uh, initially for the treatment of uh, aggressive benign primitive bone tumors, but uh, this uh, uh, indication expanded. So nowadays we are treating bone metastasis, uh, lesion due to uh, hemopathies. We also treat patients with uh, uh, spinal uh, trauma and also patients with uh, uh, fracture due to osteoporosis. So what are the contraindications for the vertebral plastic? So general contraindications uh, are mainly a patient who are contraindicated for uh, anesthesia, patient who are moribund, who have a lot of comorbidities and who cannot lie in prone position. So they are uh, contraindicated for vertebral, uh, for vertebral plastic. 
patients with aplasia because there is a risk of uh, infection, uh, patients with coagulation disorder because when you are uh, putting the bone needle in the spine, you have a risk of subcutaneous uh, hematoma. And you have also local contraindication, mostly infection, infectious disease. So if you have an, inf an infection of the, the soft tissue around the vertebra you want to treat, you have a risk to put, some, uh, uh, to put an infection inside the vertebral body while crossing the infected uh, um, soft tissue. And also, you should not do vertebroplasty when you have a spinal cord compression because you will, by injecting the cement in the, uh, the lesion, you will increase the spinal cord compression. So in patients with compression of the spinal cord or in a pre-compressive uh, uh, condition, you have first to ask the neurosurgeon to do, uh, 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 to, 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 uh, to, uh, to do a surgery to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce the compression posterior surgery, and afterwards, you will do the vertebroplasty a couple of weeks after. So what, are, what about the vertebroplasty, the cementoplasty for tumor disease? So uh, there is a, a huge arsenal, uh, therapeutic arsenal of uh, percutaneous treatment. So we can perform bone percutaneous cementoplasty for vertebra, but also for other locations, pelvic bone, for instance. But we can also perform percutaneous destruction either with heat, with radiofrequency ablation, or with cold, with uh, cryotherapy. And also in some patients uh, who are not eligible for a surgery, for a regular percutaneous treatment, we can do embolization or chemoembolization. So we inject some chemotherapy in the arteries feeding the lesion in order to reduce the size of the lesion and to obtain pain relief. So the objectives of the uh, cementoplasty and vertebroplasty for uh, spine metastasis is first to obtain an analgesic effect, so pain relief, second to consolidate the bone lesion, and there is also like a carcinolytic effect, a, a, a tumor destruction effect, because when the cement is polymerizing, it will uh, generate some heat between 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, that will do like a kind of necrosis of the lesion you are treating with the bone cement. What are the indications of uh, vertebroplasty for a spine metastasis? So we are treating painful and or unstable metastasis. So you, we have to see the patient in consultation to know which uh, metastasis is painful uh, to treat the good one. And sometimes we treat asymptomatic metastasis when patient has a unique or a prevalent uh, metastasis in order to, to try to cure the patient. Which uh, uh, vertebra we can treat by vertebroplasty? We can treat all uh, the, the, the vertebra uh, with vertebroplasty from C1. We can uh, also treat C0, the, uh, the uh, occipital condyle, uh, uh, from C1 to uh, S4, to the, the, the last vertebra of the, of the sacrum. One question, is the posterior wall disruption a contraindication to vertebroplasty? No, it's not a contraindication. You see, it's here this is a patient with this, uh, uh, this osteolytic lesion of the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. So there is a posterior wall disruption, which can, you can see here. And you can treat this patient with vertebroplasty. It's a little bit more risky. So it's, you have to be very careful when you inject the cement. You have to inject it, of course, in lateral projection and be very careful not to have a leakage inside the canal. Sometimes you can have some leakage in the anterior epidural space, but it's usually minor. And in most of the cases, you don't have any clinical uh, consequence. But you can only treat this patient with posterior wall disruption if there is no compression of the spinal cord. If there is a compression, you have first to do a posterior uh, liberation of the spinal uh, canal by surgery, because otherwise, if you inject some cement, you will increase the compression of the spinal cord. What about our experience in terms of effectiveness uh, of the vertebroplasty for uh, bone metastasis? So in terms of pain relief, you have a very fast pain relief, usually in the couple of days after the, the treatment. And in our experience, we have a, a satisfactory pain relief in about 80% of the cases. And uh, in only 5% of the cases, the patient uh, need to have an additional surgery. So in 95% of the cases, we have a good uh, bone consolidation only with a vertebroplasty. What about the literature about the uh, 
uh, the effectiveness of the vertebral plasty in spine metastasis. So pain relief is uh, obtained in uh, about 50 to uh, almost 100% of the cases. It also helps to reduce the analgesic consumption, so to uh, reduce the use uh, of uh, opioids, uh, uh, which have a lot of side effects, uh, as you know. And also the functional uh, improvement is observed from uh, 50 to more than 75% of the cases. So here you have a couple of papers focused on the effectiveness of vertebral plasty in spine metastasis. So uh, very good effective, uh, effectiveness in terms of pain relief. And as, as I told you, when the cement is polymerizing, it will, uh, it will generate some eating uh, and the temperature will uh, uh, reach from 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, and it will act like uh, uh, it will. You will have a kind of necrosis of the surrounding tissue of the metastasis, and it could be very interesting uh, for patients with a unique bone metastasis. Just uh, uh, a word about this uh, this uh, article, this study that we performed in my department. It was, it was a retrospective uh, study uh, in which we evaluated the local uh, recurrence or progression after vertebral plasty. So it was 55 uh, females uh, who had a bone metastasis from breast cancer, and we evaluated the local recurrence or progression at the level that we treated, and we observed a recurrence in only 14% of the cases, while uh, we had a remote progression, so for uh, in other uh, bone location or other uh, um, uh, organs, in 85% of the cases. And we wanted to evaluate uh, if there was some uh, predictors of local uh, recurrence or progression, and we didn't find any uh, uh, imaging uh, uh, factors that was uh, that were associated with the risk of uh, local recurrence. As I told you, vertebral plasty is very efficient for spine metastasis. Sometimes we can also use a tumor ablation technique. So the principle is very simple: is to uh, uh, to to reach the destruction of the lesion by cold or heat of the tumor lesion. The indication is when you have a unique or prevalent lesion, so you want to cure the patient by, by treating the, uh, the uh, only metastasis. And also we use this technique when we have an extension to the sur surrounding uh, soft tissue. And the objective of uh, this uh, tumor ablation technique is to obtain a local, a local tumor control and also a pain relief. So here, an example of uh, such a treatment with a tumor ablation, a 51-year-old male with a thyroid cancer. He presented an hyperalgic uh, metastasis of the left scapula. So you can see the osteolytic bone lesion with the extension to the soft tissue and the surrounding muscles. So we decided to treat this patient with cryotherapy. So here you can see under the, uh, CT guidance, the positioning of the probes for the cryotherapy. Here it's in axial projection, here it's in coronal reconstruction. Here is, this is the, a snapshot of the uh, X-ray guidance. You can see that the patient already had some vertebroplasty previously, uh, also uh, on the ribs, a cementoplasty of ribs. And here this is during the uh, ablation treatment. So this is the, uh, the, the bowl of eyes uh, of ice, which is uh, created by the probe of the cryotherapy. And this is at the end of the procedure, you can see the, the, the ball of ice, which has been created using the probe cryotherapy. And afterwards, we will uh, wait a couple of minutes and inject some cement to consolidate the lesion. So this is the, after the cement injection in the scapula. And you can see the result at the end of the procedure. Another case of patient treated by uh, tumor ablation, a patient who presented with a uh, oral cavity cancer, and he has this uh, unique T11 spine metastasis located uh, in the vertebral body on the left side. So we decided to treat this patient by tumor ablation plus vertebroplasty to consolidate the vertebral body. So here you can see the use of radiofrequency ablation. So you will put the probe of radiofrequency ablation, which will uh, create a, a local eating of the lesion. So this is the positioning of the probe under CT guidance. You can, you can uh, curve the tip of the probe inside the, the, the lesion. 
So we are eating the lesion for a couple of minutes. And afterwards, we will uh, uh, consolidate the vertebral body by injecting some uh, PMMA bone cement inside the lesion. What about the uh, benign uh, spinal tumor? So you can also use vertebroplasty for vertebral hemangioma. So you know that vertebral hemangioma are usually, in most of the cases, asymptomatic, uh, and you have painful vertebral hemangioma in about 1% of the cases. You can treat them by surgery, by radiotherapy, or by per percutaneous uh, techniques like vertebroplasty. So which hemangioma to treat? If the the hemangioma is asymptomatic and non-aggressive. You don't have to treat it because it's very frequent. It's, uh, it's useless. When the patient is, uh, has a non-aggressive hemangioma, with, but, which is symptomatic, you can propose a percutaneous treatment. When the patient is asymptomatic with an aggressive hemangioma, you can treat it before it becomes uh, 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 symptomatic. And when it's symptomatic and aggressive, we have to, to, to propose a treatment. So this is a three main uh, configuration in which we can propose uh, vertebroplasty for uh, spinal hemangioma. And in this lesion, you have to have a complete filling of the lesion with the PMMA bone cement. Otherwise, you won't have uh, the, uh, the expected pain relief. Here, an example of a C4 lesion uh, hemangioma of the, spine, uh, of the cervical spine. So you can see the lesion which is here. The patient had a huge cervical uh, pain, and we went through the right anterolateral approach to fill uh, completely the lesion with PMMA with good clinical outcome. Another example of the thoracic spine, you can uh, the T9 uh, vertebra, so you can see the typical aspect of uh, an hemangioma on CT scan. You can see that there is a vertebral collapse, so it's an aggressive hemangioma. And here we treated the patient by a vertebroplasty with a complete filling, complete filling of the vertebra in order to obtain pain relief. And in our experience, the pain relief when you, you, you treat the vertebral hemangioma is in about 90% of the, of the cases. What about aggressive vertebral hemangioma? So you know the, the imaging uh, uh, characteristic which uh, uh, can help to depict aggressive vertebral hemangioma. You, when you have an increase of the size of the hemangioma, when you have an enhancement of the hemangioma, and when it's uh, responsible for vertebral fracture, or uh, uh, when, it, when you have like uh, 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 surrounding tissue extension or epidural e extension. So in this configuration, it's uh, uh, an aggressive hemangioma. So in this uh, configuration, we first do a spinal DSA to depict the origin of the uh, radiculomedullary uh, artery, especially the Adamkevich artery. And when you have extension to the epidural component, we will do first uh, sclerosis of the epidural component. So we do it under general anesthesia because it could be painful. We use smaller bone needle. We use certain gauge bone needle. So we will, we will use a transpedicular bilateral approach and put the tip of the bone needle at the, uh, uh, the first uh, third of the posterior aspect of the vertebral body. Then we do a venography. So we inject some contrast material through the bone needle to see uh, the, the, the distribution of the contrast material in the vertebral body and in the epidural space and to depict a potential uh, anastomosis with uh, uh, with arteries, surrounding arteries. And afterward, we'll inject the uh, pure alcohol diluted with contrast material. We will inject about three milliliters in each side to, so to obtain a sclerosis of the epidural component. And two weeks after this uh, sclerosis, we will do the regular vertebroplasty. So why do we do first the sclerosis? Is to reduce the, the, the epidural extension by the sclerosis, and afterwards we inject the uh, the cement through the vertebroplasty. And in doing these uh, two steps, we avoid the progression of the cement in the epidural uh, uh, component of the uh, of the hemangioma. So here an example: you have this aggressive hemangioma, the CT scan, typical aspect of the hemangioma, and you have you have here this uh, uh, extension to the epidural space. So it's an aggressive hemangioma. We are performing first the sclerosis. So you can see the bone needle, which are at the 
posterior aspect of the vertebral body. We are doing the venography to see where the contrast material is going and where the alcohol will go. So it will go in this posterior aspect in the epidural component. And we do the slow therapy. And two weeks after, we will do the vertebroplasty. And you see, you don't have any leakage in the epidural uh, space using this uh, two steps uh, technique. And this is the CT scan after the vertebroplasty. And you can see before and after. So you have before the epidural component. So we had the sclerosis using alcohol of this epidural component before injected the PMMA, uh, PMMA inside the vertebral body. What about traumatic lesion? So uh, for traumatic lesion, usually, we do a vertebral augmentation. So it's not just a regular vertebroplasty. We, we want to reopen uh, the vertebra. So we want to push up the end plate. So we use uh, different devices. Uh, for instance, the spine jack, with a, with the, which is a jack uh, like when you have to change the wheel of your, uh, your, um, your, your car. And the main limitation is that the cannula has, are very big. So you cannot use it uh, in patients under local anesthesia or conscious sedation. So you have to use a general anesthesia. And second, uh, the cannula is very big, so you can uh, not use this device in patients with small pedicles. So the, the pedicle should be, uh, in theory at least, uh, five millimeters or more. So you can see here this uh, vertebral uh, collapse, traumatic vertebral uh, collapse. And you put the cannula in the, uh, the the pedicle, you will uh, put uh, you will insert the, uh, the, the 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 spine jack in the vertebral body, and you will uh, like uh, expand the, the spine jack. So you have two devices run from each side, and you will uh, expand. You will push up uh, the uh, superior end plate of the vertebral body, and afterwards you will inject some cement to keep this, uh, uh, this opening of the vertebral body. And this is the result in CT scan after the, uh, the, the, the vertebral expansion. We also use uh, cementoplasty for uh, uh, the, uh, the sacral fracture due to bone insufficiency, so in all patients with osteoporosis. So we know that this uh, sacral fracture are a, 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 a huge source of morbidity. It will prolong the decubitus and uh, it will uh, lead to complication uh, related to the lying uh, position. So here, an example of a patient who has this uh, H-shaped fracture of the, the sacrum. And it's very simple to treat this patient using uh, a cementoplasty. Usually, we only uh, use bone needles to inject some cement in the uh, ala of the, uh, of the sacrum, so two needles uh, from each side, and we will inject some cement to, uh, to consolidate the, uh, the, the, the fracture from each side. And usually you have a very good uh, clinical outcome just do, using this uh, simple uh, technique. And you can see here the uh, result at the end of the procedure in CT. And the main difficulty when you are using this technique is to avoid the leakage of the bone cement in the uh, sacral foramen. So uh, uh, cementoplasty are intervention. So when you are doing intervention, you have always a risk of complication. What are these complications? So cement leaks, uh, it could be related to the positioning of uh, the, the bone needle. So when the tip of your bone needle is inside a, a, a vertebral a vein, you will have some leakage in this vertebral vein. When you inject a too liquid uh, bone cement, so it will increase the risk of cement leaks. And we, when you are injecting the, 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 the cement with hyperpressure, you will increase the risk of, uh, uh, of leakage. So the different leaks that we can see are uh, intradiscal uh, leaks. You can also have some soft tissue uh, leaks, venous leaks, and the most fear of all, but very, very, very rare, the intracanal uh, leaks. So the uh, cement leaks are observed in up to 75% of the cases. But what you have to, to keep in mind is, is that uh, all these cement leaks are in uh, almost all the cases or in, in most of the cases asymptomatic. So the risk of uh, uh, perivertebral leaks is increased when you are treating sclerotic uh, lesion or mixed lesion because you will inject with high pressure and you will increase the risk of uh, cement leakage. Intradiscal leak, 
uh, leaks are not so rare, about 5% of the cases. And it's uh, frequent when you have a fracture of the end plate because you have a weak point and the cement will go in this weak point and you cannot avoid the leakage in the, uh, the, the intervertebral disc. And this leakage in the intervertebral disc may increase the risk of fracture of the adjacent vertebra. So sometimes when we have leakage in the intervertebral disc, we are treating the, uh, the, the we, uh, we do a preventive cementoplasty of the vertebral body below or uh, uh, just above to avoid secondary uh, fracture. So here you have some kind of leakage of the in the in the intervertebral disc when you have this uh, uh, disruption of the end plate and you have this weak point in which the cement will go because uh, it will go where the pressure is uh, is the lower soft tissue leaks uh, that can be observed in about eight percent of the cases and may be responsible for post vertebral plastic pain as I told you, it's not rare in cervical vertebroplasty. It will uh, be, uh, it will go along the entry point of the bone needle, and the risk factor for soft tissue leaks are um, mostly the route uh, for the positioning of the bone needle that you choose, and you, when you have a rupture of the cortical uh, bone. Venous leaks, as you know, vertebra, uh, the, the the venous uh, drainage of the vertebra is very rich. So when you inject cement inside the vertebra, you have a risk of venous leakage. So it's not so rare. You can have epidural vein leakage, but usually there is no consequence if, it, if it's a small uh, epidural uh, uh, leakage. If it's a huge epidural leakage, of course, you can have some spinal cord compression or nerve root compression. And perivertebral vein leakage are very frequent but it's, there is no, uh, no clinical consequence. But if you don't, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you continue to push the cement, you have a risk of migration in the azigo system and which will uh, uh, lead finally uh, to a pulm pulmonary uh, embolism of uh, cement. So what to do when you uh, see that uh, venous leakage uh, is occurring? So you have to stop the injection. Sometimes you can, to, can try to aspirate. And also you have to change the positioning of the needle. Because here, if you have this venous leakage and if you continue to inject the, uh, the same way, you will have a migration of the bone cement inside the azygos and hemiazygos uh, system, which is connected to the superior vena cava uh, which itself is connected to the right uh, uh, the, uh, auricles, and you will have afterwards a migration of the bone cement in the, uh, the pulmonary arteries, and it will lead to a pulmonary cement embolism. What are the complications that we can face while doing vertebroplasty? You can have some minor complications, hematoma along the course of the, uh, the bone needle. You can have transient radicular pain due to compression of the nerve, of the nerve root uh, by the bone cement. You can have some asymptomatic pulmonary cement embolism. The major complications are very, very, very rare. You can have some permanent radicular pain due to the compression of a, a bone fragment uh, with nerve roots. You can have uh, leaks inside the spinal canal, but as I told you, it's very, very, very rare if you respect the safety rules and if you inject the bone cement in lateral projection. Symptomatic pulmonary cement embolism are very, very, very rare. You can have also when you have intravertebral uh, uh, um, uh, shunt, uh, arteriovenous shunt, you can have arterial cement embolism, and of course, uh, you can have complications related to the, uh, the anesthesia. So as I told you, cement pulmonary uh, uh, embolism can be depicted on CT scan. They can be observed in up to 9% of the cases, but as I told you, it's in most cases uh, completely uh, asymptomatic. Uh, spinal cord compression or leaks inside the spinal canal in our experience uh, we, we, we did uh, more than uh, 10,000 vertebroplasty. It's, it's very, very, very rare. And we had only two cases. And uh, for this patient, we uh, asked our colleague neurosurgeon to uh, perform surgical decompression. And we had no uh, uh, definitive neurological sequelae. And usually, it's, it's because we, you, you, uh, you don't treat the good patient. Here, you don't have to do the vertebroplasty as first line. You have to do first decompressive surgery because the patient has no compression, but it's a 
pre-compressive status. So here, when you inject the cement, it will go in the posterior aspect of the lesion and it will increase the mass effect on the spinal uh, cord or on the nerve root. So here, the indication was not a good indication and maybe this patient should have been treated first by posterior decompression and afterward by vertebral plasty, but not by vertebral plasty as first line. Few controversies about vertebroplasty. So, could we treat very old patients? Is it a contraindication to vertebroplasty? What about kyphoplasty? Is it better? Is it uh, worse compared to vertebroplasty? And there is there is also an uh, open debate about vertebroplasty in osteoporosis. So, should we treat patient uh, uh, over eighty years by vertebroplasty? The answer is yes, it's not a contraindication to vertebroplasty. We publish this case series of patients uh, over 80 years of age treated by vertebroplasty, uh, more than 170 patients treated, about 73% uh, uh, of the patient had porotic fracture because it's all patient. Uh, the ASA score was three or more, it's a, it's a score to, uh, to, uh, to depict uh, comorbidities used by the anesthesiologist, so it's it was it was patient with a lot of comorbidities, and uh, speaking about the result of the vertebral plasty in in this old patient, so uh, um, pain relief was obtained in about eighty percent of the cases, and we had about ten percent of new fracture adjacent fracture in patient with osteoporosis, and which is very important in this population with a, a lot of comorbidities. We had no major complication in this uh, old patient. We had only two cases of hematoma, but which resolved spontaneously along the bone needle scores. What about comparison be between kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty? So the principle of the kyphoplasty is close to the vertebroplasty. It's a little bit more complicated. You would put some cannula in the, uh, the pedicle and through this cannula, you will inflate some balloons, two balloons in the vertebral body to re-expand the end plate of the vertebral body and to create a kind of cavity. And afterward, you will remove this balloon and inject the PMMA bone cement. So, the main drawback of this technique is that it's more expensive compared to regular vertebroplasty. It's about tenfold more expensive compared to vertebroplasty. And um, uh, when you look at the literature, the effectiveness in terms of pain relief is uh, it's not better compared to vertebroplasty. But uh, the, the, you have a, a little bit better result in terms of uh, kyphosis correction using uh, kyphoplasty and also you reduce the risk of cement leakage using kyphoplasty because you create a cavity and you will fill this cavity with the uh, PMMA bone cement and you will reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, cement clicks around the vertebra. And last controversy, the uh, benefit of vertebroplasty in osteoporosis. So the controversy started in 2009 with this article uh, by the team of the Mayo Clinic, which has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it was a randomized trial comparing vertebroplasty versus sham procedure. So it's a, it's a simulated procedure. Uh, and they enrolled 131 patients over a four-year period, and they evaluated the benefit of the vertebroplasty at one month using a pain uh, uh, visual scale. And you see that in 64% of the cases, patients had pain relief versus in 48% uh, of the cases, but the difference was not statistically significant. And another uh, important point is that in the, in the group of patients who had the uh, simulated procedure, the sham procedure, there was a crossover. So finally, the patient had the vertebroplasty in 43% of the cases. So the authors uh, 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 concluded uh, that vertebroplasty was not efficient in, uh, uh, in vertebral collapse due to osteoporosis. Afterwards, one year after in the Lancet, you have this study, Vertos 2, which was a, which was a prospective randomized multicenter trial, 451 patients enrolled in this trial. And in this trial, they compared vertebral plasty and conservative management. So the level of evidence is a little bit lower because it was not compared to sham uh, procedure. And this study, uh, Vertos 2, was positive for vertebroplasty, but as I told you, the level of evidence was a little bit lower, and the conclusion was still that vertebroplasty was not uh, a, a good treatment for uh, osteoporosis. 
And in 2016, uh, this, uh, this study, which is called VAPUR, uh, which was a prospective randomized multifentric study, it's a sham study, so they compared vertebroplasty versus the simulated uh, procedure. Uh, they only included fresh osteoporotic fracture less than six weeks after the, the fracture. They included 120 patients and they uh, compared the, the, the pain on the numeric rated scale at uh, two weeks. And this study was positive for vertebroplasty. 44% of patients who had pain relief in vertebroplasty group versus 21 in the patient who had the, the sham procedure. So this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, study was the first one with a high level of evidence proving that vertebroplasty was a good treatment in terms of pain relief for uh, vertebral collapse in porotic uh, lesion. But a couple of years after, so two years after, this other uh, study, uh, the same design, Vertos 4, which has the opposite conclusion that uh, there was no uh, benefit of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, vertebral plasty in a fracture due to osteoporosis. And a last, uh, a last paper published in 2020 in the American Journal of Neuroradiology. So in this, uh, in this study, they did a retrospective analysis of data from Medicare. So this is the, the US uh, medical system of all patients treated by uh, for vertebral uh, compression fra fracture due to osteoporosis. So it was more than 2 million patients. And they compared three groups, medical treatment group, kyphoplasty group, and vertebroplasty uh, group. And they uh, uh, compared the, the survival between these uh, three groups, and they calculated the number needed to treat uh, between these three groups at one year and five years uh, follow-up. And when you look at the result, for the, so they evaluated the rate of patients who died at follow-up. So when you uh, uh, compare the survival only with a medical treatment, so only 41% of, of the patients survived at follow-up versus 50% in the kyphoplasty group. When you compare medical treatment and vertebroplasty, about 42% of the patients survived at follow-up in the medical treatment versus 48% in the vertebroplasty. And also when you compare vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, the rate of patients who survived at follow-up was higher in patients treated by kyphoplasty. And here you have the number of patients needed to be treated uh, comparing balloon kyphoplasty versus medical treatment. So uh, 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 result in favor of kyphoplasty with uh, about 12 patients needed to be treated uh, in the uh, kyphoplasty group. And the same result when you compare vertebroplasty uh, versus medical treatment and better result uh, when you compare kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. So, the, the conclusion uh, of, this, uh, of this work is that when you do vertebroplasty or vertebroplasty compared to uh, medical treatment, you uh, increase the chance of, uh, uh, of survival of your patient and the number of patients needed to be treated with kyphoplasty compared to the medical management is 15 and the number of patients needed to be treated when you compare vertebroplasty to medical management is 23. Of course, there are some limitations because it was a retrospective study and an observational study. So it's uh, like uh, an ongoing debate about the benefit of vertebroplasty in osteoporosis. It's, it's kind of never ending uh, story. A few words about the challenging cases. I told you that you can treat all the, 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 the bones uh, in the body with cementoplasty. So you can treat very uh, challenging uh, uh, lesion of the, uh, of the sacrum, for instance. So it was a 56 year old female with low back pain with a visual analog scale uh, at uh, 8 uh, over 10. CT and MRI showed uh, S2 hemangioma, which was biopsy proven. So you can see here on the CT scan the lesion, which is close to the posterior aspect of the, uh, the, the S2 uh, 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 bone. And so very close to the, 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 the the canal here and close here to the uh, sacral foramina. So you have a posterior wall disruption. You can see on uh, T2 and T1 weighted uh, images with contrast and enhancement uh, that there is a, a small epidural uh, extension. So this uh, lesion is very challenging to treat. So the strategy we use, we use an hybrid androsuite combining 
a monoplan a flat panel and a CT scan. So we are positioning the bone needle under CT guidance through the transsacroiliac uh, route. And afterward, we will move the patient to the, uh, the uh, C-arm uh, fluoroscopy guidance to inject the PMMA bone cement under fluoroscopy. So this is the, the, the facility we have. So this is the C-arm with a flat panel. And at the, uh, uh, in, in the same room, we have the CT scan, the CT gantry, and the patient is lying on this table. So you can uh, uh, translate the patient from the C-arm towards the CT gantry. So here's the positioning of the bone needle under uh, a CT guidance through the transsacroiliac route. Here, the tip of the needle. So this is the final positioning of the needle, the good position inside the, the lesion. And afterwards, we will inject the bone cement under fluoroscopic guidance to depict any uh, leakage either in the sacral foramina or in the spinal canal. This is the lateral projection. You can see here the posterior wall. And afterwards, we will inject under fluoroscopic guidance the bone cement in AP and lateral projection. And you have the final result. So you have a satisfactory feeling of the lesion with no leakage inside the spinal, uh, the spinal canal and no leakage in the sacral foramen. A second challenging case, case a 53-year-old male with cervical pain uh, with a visual, uh, visual analog scale of 10. And you have this uh, lesion on CT scan. So you have a lesion of the left lateral mass of C1 with an extension to the surrounding soft tissue. And the main difficulty to treat this lesion by vertebroplasty is the close relationship of this lesion with the vertebral artery, which surrounds the B3 segment of the vertebral artery, which surrounds the uh, lateral mass of C1. And you can see here, the, in coronal reconstruction, you can see the lateral mass of C1, which has uh, present a, a, a collapse. And here you can see the MRI. So it was an hemangioma, which uh, was biopsy proven, hemangioma, aggressive hemangioma of the lateral mass of C1 with an extension to the surrounding soft tissue. And the, you can see the close relationship with, uh, from, between the lesion and the left vertebral R2. We perform a DSA, so it's uh, an injection through the left vertebral artery. And you can see some very small feeders uh, uh, supplying this hypervascular lesion, which was an aggressive hemangioma. So the strategy here was to uh, also treat the patient in or hybrid angiosuite and to uh, put a bone needle inside the, uh, the lateral mass of C1, the left lateral, lateral mass of C1, via a transoral route to avoid uh, a wound of the vertebral artery. And also, we uh, put in a, a, a balloon, a non-detachable balloon, which was inflated in the V3 segment of the vertebral artery while injecting the uh, PMMA bone cement under fluoroscopy. So you can see the view of the, the route. So this is, a, we use a, a Boyle Davis mousse gag to open the, the, the mouse of the patient and to expose the posterior aspect of the, uh, of the uh, pharynx. And here, the positioning of the bone needle through the oral cavity after this infection, of course. And this is the CT guidance of the positioning of the uh, bone needle. So you can see here, we are advancing step by step the bone needle inside the, uh, uh, the lesion of the left lateral mass of C1. This is the final positioning of the bone needle. This is the, the mousse gag to open the mouth of the patient. And this is here the, the guiding catheter and the balloon, which will be inflated in the vertebral uh, uh, artery in order to avoid uh, leakage through the uh, retrograde leakage through the small feeders which were arising from the vertebral artery. And this is the result after the injection of bone cement under uh, fluoroscopic guidance. So we had a satisfactory uh, feeling of the lesion and the patient, uh, we treated this patient more than 10 years ago and he had a complete pain relief, a good functional reco recovery and on imaging follow-up, we don't, didn't have any uh, progression of the, of the lesion. Final uh, um, kind of treatment that we can uh, propose for a bone lesion. What about the, uh, the benefit of cementoplasty for long bones uh, lesion? So uh, uh, for the, the, the PMMA bone cement has a good resistance to compression constraints, but it has a poor resistance for 
a torsion and flexion constraint. So in long bone, uh, uh, the cementoplasty alone uh, usually does not provide a sufficient stability and you have a risk of secondary fracture. So here, an example, not of a long bone lesion, but of C2 lesion, because C2 has some uh, flexion constraint due to the joint, the C1, C2 uh, joint. So here it was a, a, a nosteoclinic lesion of the body and of the dense of C2 uh, due to a metastasis. You can see here on MRI this metastasis. And we treated this patient uh, by the anterolateral approach that I showed you and to inject some cement inside the osteolytic lesion. This is the result at the end of the procedure, which is very good, a good feeling of the lesion. But as I told you, you have some flexion constraint on this, uh, on this vertebra that you don't have on other vertebrae. And we had a fracture uh, through the uh, semen cast, and finally the patient had to be operated. So in this uh, kind of lesion, usually what we do is either screw fixation or we use what we call the reinforced cementoplasty. And the concept of the, of the reinforced cementoplasty is the same as the reinforced concrete. So you, we don't just use cement, but we put some spindles inside the cement to uh, increase the resistance of the cement, especially to the torsion and flexion constraint. So uh, a few words about the technical aspect of this technique. So of course, as for vertebral plasty, we use strict surgical asepsy. As for vertebral plasty, we inject some uh, antibiotics during the procedure. We use usually a general anesthesia to treat this patient because it could be painful. We use a bigger bone needle compared to regular vertebral plasty. The, the size of the bone needle is nine gauge. And we uh, put some uh, uh, spindle, stainless steel spindle inside through the, the bone needle in order to, uh, uh, to enhance the uh, resistance of the bone cement. So the spindle has a diameter of uh, 2.5 millimeter and we have different lengths from five to eight millimeter. So the first uh, patient we treated using this uh, reinforced cementoplasty technique was uh, for patient with prefracture lesion of the femoral neck. You can evaluate the risk of fracture using this uh, Mirel's score. And we did some, uh, some comp computed uh, um, uh, simulation to see if we can uh, um, have the same uh, resistance using reinforced cementoplasty as the LC bone. So here, an example, you have this osteoglytic lesion of the cervical uh, neck of the, uh, of the femur. And we put two needles, nine gauge needles. And through these needles, under fluoroscopic guidance, we will put these uh, spindles in, in, in order in the, in the, in the cervical, uh, in the neck of the uh, uh, proximal aspect of the femur. And Afterwards, around this spindle, we will inject some cement to reinforce, to obtain this kind of uh, reinforced concrete. And here you have the CT scan after the procedure. So we published in 2017 uh, a short case series using this technique. And using this technique, we didn't have any uh, secondary uh, fracture and we had good uh, clinical outcome in terms of pain uh, relief. So here you can see we, we are putting uh, several uh, spindles uh, in order to, uh, to reinforce the, the bone before injecting the cement to reduce the risk of secondary uh, fracture. You can also use this technique for fracture of the humerus. So we published a case series on six patients uh, who had who were, uh, uh, were not eligible for surgery because they were like in a palliative uh, uh, fashion treatment. And here you have this patient uh, who presented this fracture of the, uh, the, the, the humerus, the right humerus. And uh, here you uh, put the needle through the superior aspect of the humerus to, to, uh, to, uh, to catheterize uh, the distal aspect of the fracture. And we are putting several spindles inside the, 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 the fracture. And afterward, we inject some cement to uh, increase the, uh, the resistance of uh, this uh, reinforced uh, cementoplasty. Another example of patient with this uh, uh, bone metastasis of the proximal aspect of the uh, left humerus. Uh, it was a metastasis uh, secondary to a colon concert. And you see, we put the bone needle uh, through the superior aspect of the humerus. We are putting several uh, spindles inside the, uh, the fracture. And afterward, we inject the cement to uh, obtain this reinforced cementoplasty. And here you have 
the uh, city uh, the, the city control which shows you the good consolidation of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, tumor fracture and we also uh, reported a good clinical outcome in terms of uh, pain relief and good functional outcome in um, with mobility of the of the arm and we uh, in this short case series had no secondary fracture that occurred during the follow up and last patients that we can treat using this reinforced cementoplasty technique, patients with pelvic bone uh, tumor uh, lesion. So uh, we reported 14 patients with uh, such uh, uh, pelvic bone tumor lesion, either on the iliac wing, on the acetabulum, or in the, in the sacral region. Here you have an example of a 38 year old female with a breast uh, cancer with a uh, bone metastasis. She presented uh, uh, low back pain for six months and you can see this uh, voluminous uh, lesion involving the left aspect of the sacrum and the left iliac wing. And here you have the, uh, the, the, the radiograph after the reinforced cementoplasty. So we went through the transsacroiliac route and put it five uh, spindles and then injected the cement to reinforce uh, the, the lesion of both the sacrum and the uh, iliac wing and the clinical outcome was good with a reduction of pain at six month follow-up and no fracture uh, during the, the clinical follow-up and so in this uh, case series we had uh, both good clinical outcome in terms of pain relief and also in terms of uh, functional imp improvement and only one patient had a, 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 had a recurrence uh, due to tumor disease uh, progression. But sometimes we have some complex lesion in which we cannot use this technique. For instance, this patient, a 70-year-old female with a history of breast cancer, and you have multiple pathologic uh, uh, fracture of the pelvic bone, of the sacrum, of the acetabulum, of the uh, iliac uh, uh, bone. So in this case, usually we use the screw uh, uh, the percutaneous screw uh, fixation, so under general anesthesia. Here, we did a screw fixation of the sacral lesion through a transsacroiliac lesion, and we do a screw fixation plus cement of this acetabulum lesion and iliac lesion in order to, uh, to stabilize uh, this lesion uh, through using uh, two screws uh, in this uh, uh, malignant uh, fracture. Technical complications that we can uh, face using the uh, reinforced cementoplasty. An example of a patient who has this uh, prefracture lesion of the neck uh, uh, of the uh, proximal femur. We did the reinforced uh, uh, cementoplasty technique. Two uh, needles were put, and here, when you push the spindle inside the femoral neck, the spindle is pushed too far in the, uh, the, uh, uh, in the joint. So here you have no choice, you have to remove this spindle, which is not so easy by a percutaneous suit. So what we do, we do the catheterization technique. So you recatheterize the spindle with the bone needle and we will inject some cement just inside the bone needle to, uh, to, have, to, to grab the proximal aspect of the spindle and to remove both the bone needle and the uh, spindle. So that's what we did, we recatheterize this uh, spindle inject the cement when uh, we waited uh, um, 15 minutes and removed this spindle to avoid this uh, complication with the spindle inside the coxofemoral uh, joint. So in conclusion, cementoplasty and vertebroplasty are safe and effective techniques. The risk of complication is very, 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 very low. Um, it's, uh, the, the pain relief usually is obtained very quickly and it's long lasting. We also have a, a good bone consolidation using this technique, and there is a probable uh, cartinolytic effect, a destruction, tumor destruction effect, just due to the eating of the bone cement. The posterior wall destruction is not a contraindication, uh, except if there is a, a symptomatic compression of the spinal cord or of the, the nerve roots. Uh, for pelvic bone lesion, we usually we use reinforced cementoplasty or screw fixation. And for long bones, uh, cementoplasty alone usually is not efficient to uh, prevent 
fracture, and in these cases, we use a cementoplasty. And just before concluding, you know that there will be a big event in Paris in 2024, which will be the Olympic Games, but we, there will be an even bigger uh, uh, event, which will be the masterclass of uh, neurovascular anatomy that we are organizing with my team in Paris, the 19th and 20th of April. And you will see a lot of uh, very fancy images uh, on anatomy, especially on embryology. So if you want to, uh, to, uh, to attend this meeting, you are more than welcome. And I give you the, the QR code uh, that you can scan for the registration to this, uh, uh, to this meeting, which will be held the 19th and 20th of April uh, of this year. And I, will, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. If you have any question. And thank you, Professor, for this outstanding uh, lecture and outstanding speak. Uh, I have heard a lot of times someone to speak about vertebroplasty, but this time was one of the best uh, speakers. I think you are one of the best speakers I have seen in vertebroplasty. Thank you. So I have, you before much. starting to ask the questions of our participants, I have a few questions of myself that I want to ask you. So lately, uh, I'm doing MRI before doing vertebroplasty to my patients in order to find uh, symptomatic fractures. I'm looking for steer sequences uh, for yeah. hyperintensity. Are you using MRI before uh, doing vertebroplasty uh, in order to uh, find symptomatic fractures and not doing vertebroplasty on the asymptomatic fractures? What do you think about that? Always do both MRI and CT because if you if you have a patient with probable osteoporotic fracture, uh, sometimes you have old fracture. Sometimes you have both old and recent fracture, so you have to treat only the recent fracture, not the, the old one. And sometimes on CT, you cannot see a recent fracture because there is no collapse of the vertebral body. There is, you just have the edema of the, of the spongious bone, and you will only see it on, on MRI, on, a, on a, a steer MRI. So I recommend to do uh, for this patient always a MRI before doing the vertebroplasty. Otherwise, you may treat the wrong uh, level and the patient won't experience a, a clinical improvement. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I want to Sorry, Edwin. Can you please uh, stop your screen sharing so we can see each other? Yeah. Be good. Uh, thank you. So I have a few more questions. What is your uh, personally favorable technique? Are you doing unilateral or bilateral? And uh, are you using local anesthesia or you are doing, uh, using general anesthesia? So for the approach, the, the, the transpedicular, bilateral transpedicular approach is very easy. The problem is when you are treating, I don't know, four or five levels at the same time, you will, you will have bone needle everywhere. So it's very complicated. So yes. in, this, in this kind of patient, usually for, vertebra, for osteoporotic uh, fracture, I use posterior lateral uh, approach and only one needle per uh, per level, and uh, so it, in in this kind of uh, lesion, uh, I use only uh, poster one needle for uh, with the posterior lateral approach. And concerning the, the the modality of the anesthesia, honestly, the patient treated under local anesthesia has have a bad experience because it, it could be painful when you, even, even if you do a good local anesthesia of the periosteum, sometimes it could be very painful because they have a fracture. So when you put a needle in a fracture, it's very painful, of course. So we prefer to use the conscious sedation. And as I told you, when you use bigger material for a spine jack or in young patient who, who have a, a very a dense bone, we use general anesthesia because sometimes when you have to put the bone needle in the, in the vertebral body in a young patient, you have to use the, 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 the it, it could be very, very difficult. You have to use a hammer and it could be very, very, uh, and very Im uh, impressive for the patient. So that's why okay. we use general anesthesia. But local anesthesia, it's almost never. Thank you. I have, uh, I have one more question. Uh, what do you think about using antibiotic impregnated cement for using? Because lately I have seen a patient who developed spondylodistite after using vertebroplasty. I don't know if you have seen such kind of complication, but what do you, what do you think about using antibiotic impregnated cement? I don't have the experience of such uh, cement, but it, why not? It could be a good idea, but the, the, what we do in my institution, we inject uh, IV uh, cefazoline, the same protocol as for orthopedists during the procedure, and the, the rate of uh, infectious complication 
is super low. Uh, it's only in patients, uh, you know, who have uh, uh, an aplasia, who are, who are treated uh, with, uh, with chemotherapy, but it's super rare. It's less than 1,000 1, uh, patients. It's very, very rare. Well. So if you do it with a, in good condition with a surgical asepsy, uh, the risk of, uh, of, um, of infectious complication is super low, super low. Okay, thank you. And what kind of viscosity are you using? High viscosity or low viscosity? When do you inject the cement? Are you waiting it to be like toothpaste? So what we usually we use like the regular bone cement, PMMA bone cement. So it's a low viscosity, but I think you have to know how your cement behaves. So it's you can use whatever you want, but uh, what cement you, you prefer, but uh, uh, you have to know how it behaves. So usually what we do, we use a low viscosity bone cement and we start to inject the bone cement at, at three, four minutes. And at 12 minutes, you cannot inject anymore the bone cement. But the, uh, the interest of the high viscosity bone cement is the, 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 the window, the time window to inject the cement is, is longer. So if you are treating a lot of uh, level at the same time, maybe it could be uh, better to use a uh, high viscosity uh, cement. Okay, thank you. I have no more questions. I'm gonna ask the questions of our participants now. So, okay, there is a comment from Yunus. Uh, I, Yunus Aydan, uh, thank you very much for this uh, didactic presentation. And he, he has a question. Do you do open cement applications in patients who have spinal stenosis accompanied by fractures? He says, I apply, I apply some cases who are candidate for near future decompressive surgery. So you mean, mean a, a minimum invasive uh, uh, treatment for a patient who have a reduction of the spinal canal due to uh, osteo uh, due to uh, degenerative disease, right? Yeah, we, we don't do that. But, but you, you have some, some implant to, to treat this patient, but we don't have the experience using this implant. I think it's not a regular practice at this day. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a, a comment from and question from Yanis Bojo. He says, thank you for the mar marvelous lecture. His question is, if there is, a sympt if there is symptomatic, atypical, non-aggressive hemangioma located in pedicle, what would your approach be? And do you routinely recommend using uh, low molecular uh, heparin, I think, because of intravenous cement leakage to avoid pulmonary or cardiac complications? So when you, when you have a an, an regular uh, hemangioma, so non-aggressive hemangioma uh, according to the imaging uh, characteristic, but which is painful, so you have to see the patient in consultation to see if the, 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 the pain is at the same uh, location as the hemangioma. But we are treating a lot of uh, non-aggressive hemangioma, painful non-aggressive hemangioma. And when you have an extension to the pedicle, we are doing the pediculoplasty at the same time. So you inject in the vertebral body in the, the hemangioma itself. And when you are pulling a little bit the, the bone needle, you inject the cement inside the pedicle. So it's not very difficult. And for to avoid the, the venous leakage, uh, when we have a venous leakage, we don't use uh, heparin, uh, even when we have uh, um, pulmonary cement embolism, because I think it's useless. Usually, it's 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 in almost all the cases it's asymptomatic. It could be as, it could be symptomatic only if the patient has an underlying uh, pulmonary uh, disease. But if the patient has no pulmonary disease, if you have two drops of bone cement, usually it has no consequence, and you don't need to put a, a heparin in this patient. In my experience. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to add a little bit from my experience. I have seen a patient who died from a pulmonary embolization one time, just one case. Yeah, it's uh, possible. But if you stop to inject when you see, you know, a venous leakage before having, it, it, it happens when you have a massive pulmonary uh, embolism of cement. But if you are very uh, careful and when you stop injecting, when you see, as I showed you, a, a leakage uh, in the vein, usually, you don't have this kind of uh, of um, very uh, uh, bad prognosis uh, complication. Yeah, we can avoid with doing a lot of X-rays and uh, with adding a little bit of cement every time. Yeah, a little dose. Okay, there is a, a question from Musa Chirak. He says, "Thank you for your excellent lecture. Is there a superiority between kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty?" As I told you, in terms of pain relief, no. 
the, the, the literature uh, shows no uh, superiority of kyphoplasty, but in terms of uh, uh, um, reopening of the vertebra and in terms of reduction of uh, uh, venous leaks, uh, kyphoplasty is better. The main drawback of kyphoplasty is that uh, it's a little bit, uh, um, it's, uh, the, 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 the treatment is uh, uh, a little bit more complicated. It's, uh, the, the length of the treatment is, uh, is uh, it's longer and the patient should be treated under general anesthesia. So that's why we usually prefer as first line uh, regular vertebroplasty because it's a uh, very uh, quick and safe. Yeah, and lesser radiation for the surgeons. Yeah, which is important. Yeah, okay. Uh, th there is a, a comment and question from Ihan Kanat. He says, thank you for this presentation. He would like to ask, what do you think about the pain subsiding mechanism following vertebroplasty? You mean the, 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 the Why the pain fracture? decreases after vertebroplasty? Why the pain decreases? Add because you are fracturing, you, you are you are fixing the, the fracture. It's like you know, uh, like uh, like when you do surgery, you, the, 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 the fracture uh, doesn't move anymore, and that's why when you consolidate the, the, the fracture. So this is this uh, consolidation which helps to to obtain the the uh, uh, pain relief. And for bone metastasis, it will uh, you know it will. Uh, have an effect on the, the, the fiber, the nociceptive fiber when you inject the cement with the heat, which is uh, uh, created by the polymerization and it will destroy this uh, nociceptive fibers and it will participate to the, the pain relief. Thank you. And uh, uh, there is a comment from uh, Dr. Nurova Kösmene, who is a neurosurgical resident in Izmir, uh, Turkey. He says, thank you for, uh, Professor. It was a great, very informative lecture. Okay. Thank you. And there is a, another question from Ihan Kanat. What do you think about unilater unilateral vertebroplasty? Unilateral. As I told you, it, it, you can use only one bone needle through the posterior lateral approach, but sometimes it's not so easy to reach the center aspect of the, of the vertebral body. When you treat some patient with osteoporosis, it's very easy to, to change the direction of the bone needle because the, the, the bone is very soft. So using this posterior lateral approach, it's easy to, to reach the center aspect of the vertebral body. In younger patient with a LC bone, uh, it's much more difficult. So when you use only one needle, sometimes you are just lateral in the vertebral body and you will feel only half of the vertebral body, which is not what the goal of the treatment. Thank you. Uh, well, there is from Musa Chirak, Turkey. What is the amount of cement for thoracic, lumbar, or cervical vertebra? As I told you, for cervical vertebra, it's uh, between two and three milliliter. For uh, um, I would say L5 or L4, sometimes it's 10 millimeters, uh, milliliters. So it depends. But um, you have to keep in mind uh, that you you don't need to full to 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 fill all the vertebra uh, when you treat a patient with osteoporosis because you will increase. The, the constraint of the other vertebra and it will uh, promote the, the uh, adjacent fracture. So when we treat osteoporosis uh, uh, lesion, we don't try to fill all the, the vertebra. We try to fill, I would say, half or two thirds of the vertebra. And the same for, uh, for uh, tumor lesion. Uh, it has been shown that the, uh, the pain relief uh, is not uh, uh, proportional to the filling of the lesion. So we try to fill the lesion, but uh, by avoiding uh, cement leakage. But you don't have to, to be uh, 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 too aggressive uh, because you you won't uh, increase the chance of uh, uh, of having a pain relief. It's only for hemangioma. For hemangioma, you have to fill all the lesion. Otherwise, the, it's it's uh, it's it's useless. Thank you. And um, there is another question from Dr. Selim Bozda. She's a neurosurgeon from Turkey. And she says, thank you for this detailed presentation. Do you perform vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty in aospine type 3 thoracolumbar fractures with a compressed canal? In many of the cases I have applied, I have seen that the retropulsed fragment is reduced over time. I think it is indirect decompression method if the ligament is intact. What is your opinion? Very good question. Yeah. We have the same impression when you have uh, the posterior uh, uh, wall is pushed inside the canal, but there is no uh, uh, symptomatic compression. So uh, you, you can usually we use the, the spine jack technique and it will reintegrate the, 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 this protrusion 
by reopening the vertebra. So usually it's very efficient and uh, in terms of pain relief and in terms of, uh, uh, of reduction of this, uh, 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 this, uh, this migration of the posterior aspect of the, of the posterior wall. So it, it, it's, a good, it's, a good, uh, it's a good strategy. But we use, in these cases, uh, we use the spine jack. Okay, thank you, sir. I don't have, I don't see any more questions. So, okay, I'm gonna give the word to the professor Hassan Kamil Suju. I want to thank you again, professor. It was very thank you, good. Adina. Thank you. Uh, wait, there is a, uh, a last question. Comment, Jan Kosai. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Use of cementoplasty augmented with K wires for common femoris fractures is very interesting and promising method. What are your indications for this method? In which patients do you use this method? This question. The method with a with a spindle, the, the reinforced cementoplasty? Yes, for uh, femoris, colifemoris fractures. Colifemoris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, 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 uh, we use this technique for long bones because, uh, as I told you, if you do just regular cementoplasty, for femoral neck or for uh, humerus or femur, it will be useless because you, you, you will have the fractures through the bone cement because there is no resistance of the bone cement to uh, flexion and torsion constraints. Uh, his question is, what are the indications for this method? Indications? Uh, usually it's a, it's a patient who are contraindicated uh, to surgery because it's it's not as good as surgery because uh, you know it's uh, only spindle with cement so it's for a patient who has a, a painful lesion and who are contraindicated for surgery because of their uh, general condition or because they are in the palliative uh, uh, scheme of treatment so we use this treatment uh, this uh, uh, reinforced cementoplasty for this kind of patients thank you Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you again. I'm going to give now the word to thank Professor you. Hassan Kamil Sujo. Uh, I want to thank again, like you. Uh, what do you think about uh, injection of alcohol without vertebroplasty for the uh, aggressive vertebral hemangiomas? Do you perform any alcohol injection without any cement? Um, it, it's an option, but the problem it uh, it will uh, it it won't reinforce the vertebral body, so you have a risk of secondary vertebral collapse. So we use uh, the alcohol uh, uh, injections, the sclerosis with alcohol, only to treat the uh, epidural component, and uh, the the cement is uh, is the the goal of the using the cement is to uh, to reinforce the vertebral body to avoid a secondary fracture. If you use only alcohol, you, you don't uh, don't prevent this secondary fracture. Uh, uh, Edwin, uh, I want to share uh, my screen for uh, to, to present of a course. case. Uh, okay, and uh, I want to show one of my cases. Mm -hmm. oh, wait a minute. Which one? Which one? Which one? This is okay. Spinal tumors. Okay. Do you see the? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, this case was uh, about fifteen years ago, actually, and uh, at that time she was a young lady and with uh, paraparesis and uh, in the T uh, four vertebra there was a aggressive hemangioma, uh, as you can see in T1 weighted uh, sagittal MR images. And this is the T2 weighted uh, axial and sagittal images. Uh, and it, it's a very mm, aggressive. And yeah. I Actually, I am afraid of uh, doing something, some operation. And I decided it, this was my uh, first case. Uh, I have uh, given the alcohol. Look at the CT. And in the uh, emergency service, I injected six uh, milligram uh, milliliters uh, alcohol okay. inside of the 
T two T four vertebra. After that, I took the control uh, graphics, but I didn't like it. I, I wanted to operate uh, this lady, but my friend at that time said to me that uh, wait a minute, wait, uh, we, we can wait a little bit. The patient is not so bad. So the patient discharged and I lost the follow up, the patient. And then uh, two years ago, my friend came to me and said to me that there was a woman, there was a young lady, and we injected alcohol. Uh, where is she now? I didn't know. And then we actually, we uh, we find her. We found her after 15 years, and she's working in the um, uh, how can I say village, village girl, village woman. And we took control cities like this, and this hemangioma, aggressive hemangioma, completely disappeared. Yeah, and this is. Uh, MRI image. We inject impressive. only only alcohol and this this lady healed completely. It was an interesting case. Yeah, yeah. You you had like a, a bone remodeling uh, during the the following year. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. It could happen, but as I told you, sometimes you can, you have a, a, a minor risk of uh, of collapse. But here you have a very good outcome. It's a very nice case. Uh, yeah. It's a, an interesting uh, case yeah, yeah. for me. Very nice. Uh, and uh, we have a very long follow-up. Uh, yeah, 15 years. Patient. It was an amazing lecture. And I want to thank, thank you again. I want to thank everyone who joined us this evening, this night. Thank you. Thank you again for your invitation. Thank you. Good evening. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye.